The country has to move forward. I would not have allowed this election to happen if I had wanted to extend my power. Do you understand what I mean? All mechanisms should be aligned to the Constitution, which was voted by the people in the referendum. In 2014, a military coup led to Thailand's elected Pua Thai Party being ousted. Five years on, and the country has held its first post-coup election, but it's been mired in controversy and confusion. Early results suggested the pro-military Palang Pracharat Party was well ahead in the popular vote. But former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat says the poll was plagued by inconsistencies. Whatever happened, the result remains unclear. And now seven opposition parties determined to block the military's return to power say they've formed a coalition. They say that's enough to get rid of what they see as a military dictatorship. Well, let's go to Bangkok now. And joining me is Titinan Pongsudirak. He's a political science professor and director of the Institute of Security and International Studies. Good to have you on the program. So is this going to be disputed until May 9th? Is everybody going to claim that they won until then? It's going to be a long, drawn-out process. You know, it's a, it's a pity because we have had uh, eight years with no elections, uh, and five years of, of those eight years have been under military government. So there's been a lot of uh, expectation for some, some clarity, uh, some new era, um, some democratic rule. But in fact, the vote was um, was clear but controversial. Um, you know, you had a kind of a split decision uh, and a kind of a, an unfair, uh, uneven uh, playing field. So there are a lot of uh, controversies, uh, acrimony. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's unclear. Uh, until we have the final results announced in May, I don't think that we'll have a, a clear picture. And then we're looking at the government being formed officially in June. Until then, there'll be a lot of jogging, a lot of haggling, wrangling. Um, horse trading, and, you know, it's unfortunate because uh, that's what uh, Thai people are uh, fed up with Thai politicians because they're always squabbling and wrangling for power, and that's what we're seeing now. What gives the opposition, poor Thai, and their allies such confidence to make the claim that they're making right now? Well, they, they have added up numbers, and they think they have enough uh, to command a simple majority in the lower house of uh, representatives. Uh, you know, we have a 500 member, so if you have 251, you know, that's a bare minimum, bare majority. So they seem to have that uh, uh, up to 255. But uh, let's remember, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think, a little bit premature. They are very eager to prevent, preempt uh, the military government from returning. But in the weeks ahead, I suspect that the election commission will um, investigate and maybe charge um, some fraud claims. Mm -hmm. So and there will be some by-elections, re-elections. So the numbers uh, at the margins will shift around a little bit. By May, I don't, I'm not sure if the opposition bloc will, will still have this number. Right. If the anti-military parties do win, does that necessarily mean that the military will be reduced in their role in the country and defanged from the politics? Um, unlikely, because the, the military government uh, and the military junta uh, that seized power in May 2014, they have ensured that they will be supervising Thai politics for the long term. Uh, they set up a committee to write a new constitution. So a new constitution is really a, a kind of a pro-military, uh, anti-politician, anti-political party kind of constitution. So, you know, in the longer term, they have the Senate that they will appoint. The Senate gets to uh, select the prime minister. So you're looking at, uh, you know, a bicameral legislature, but one third of it uh, belongs to the military already. So if the military can, can, can control uh, one quarter uh, or even one half of the lower house, they can kind of uh, stay in power, but they will have a weak, uh, st a weak coalition government because the opposition bloc is strong enough to uh, obfuscate, to stymie uh, lawmaking. Mm -hmm. Can we say that the days of coups are over? I mean, I don't know, I was, I was trying to count, looking at the history, more than 20 confirmed and successful coups since the 1930s, right? So whether the pro-military parties or the anti-military parties win, the military will be involved and there, but can we say coups are off the table? Um, Imran, it's not uh, easy to say that for Thailand um, because, you know, we've had 13 successful coups. I mean, 19 to, uh, altogether, uh, 20 constitutions since 1932 in 87 years. So, you know, Thailand has been up and down. It's been very volatile. 
Uh, however, the Thai economy has managed to develop, to grow. So there's been a decoupling between politics and the economy. We've had a cool cycle. There's a cool, um, you know, there's a new constitution, there's election, there's a government, there's some corruption, there's a coup again. This is known as, uh, as Thailand's cool cycle. Mm -hmm. But this time, I think, uh, in this new era, under a new monarch, um, it could be different. I think in the last uh, seven decades, under our previous king, who was very popular, widely revered, uh, the military and the monarchy were seen as a symbiotic uh, relationship. And so, you know, the coup making was part and parcel of that relationship. And the politicians and the political parties were weak. Uh, but this time, I think we're seeing some emergence of new parties, new generations, and maybe some strengthening of uh, political parties. At the same time, a new king, new monarch, um, you know, it's not the same. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to want, uh, his majesty does not seem to want to be used as a political tool. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think that maybe this era, we may not see as many coups, but, but perhaps, um, you know, we can never dismiss a coup in Thailand, mm -hmm. but the likelihood seems uh, seems much less than the previous, in, in, than in the previous reign. Right, so the numbers are contested at the moment, different sides claiming they're winning or have won. Can we say at the very least, that there's been a democratic spirit to these elections? Um, there has been a democratic transition, uh, in, but you know, the democratic transition remains um, under military custody, let's say. So the military still very much uh, dominates Thai politics uh, through the rules, rules making, the constitution, and also through the referees, such as the election commission. And of course, through the army, through the junta. So, you know, Thailand is still uh, in the middle of the woods somewhere between author military authoritarianism mm -hmm. and uh, democratic rule. We're looking for some kind of a balance to emerge out of this, uh, to have some kind of democratic rule that works uh, for the population, for Thai voters, but also that strengthens uh, democratic institutions at the same time, maintaining some of the corporate interests of the military mm -hmm. uh, in order to have mm -hmm. some kind of compromise. So that's what we're looking for. In the weeks ahead, I'm sorry to say, is there's no closure, there's no complete clarity. It's right. a kind of a drawn out right. drama. Uh, but within the next 18 months, I think we will see some kind of clarity. And as part of the social contract, um, I guess the Thai people's relationship to the king is different to other people's relationship to, to monarchs and with the military as well. So when it comes to the military, how much of a role do the Thai people want the military to have in the society? Is there a, an overwhelming respect for the military? Um, I think this is a, a question that, you know, sometimes Thailand is compared to Turkey, and I think it's a, it's a good comparison. I mean, increasingly, Thai people want to get behind the military. They want to uh, you know, see the backs of the military. They want to see the military back in the barracks. Um, but... This means that the, the politicians and the political parties also have to, to deliver, to satisfy um, popular expectations, aspirations, and we're not seeing that yet. Uh, in the recent past, of course, the military has provided a backstop, uh, it's provided some, some balance, but I think its days are numbered. Uh, the challenge will be to bring up a new civilian generation, civilian-led uh, political leaders, political uh, parties, in order um, to increasingly um, persuade the military, the army especially, to go back to the barracks. Titanan Pong Sudirak, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers.